Decision trees are a useful uh, decision-making tool in business for operations uh, when we have uncertain outcomes. And I'd highlight that this video provides a, an introduction and an overview of how to execute decision trees. Uh, I have a separate video, which is already posted, which goes through an example exactly of developing the decision tree. So I would encourage you to, to, to take a look at both of them as they, as they really complement each other. So let's begin. Decision trees are about understanding uh, what potential outcomes are if we have uncertain uh, outs, uh, what returns are if we have uncertain outcomes. And it can be used to, to it, we're, we're talking about it here in the context of capacity decisions, but it can be used in a variety of decisions and simple decision trees and frankly very complex and large decision trees get used all of the time and what it is is we're doing it to to develop the expected monetary value of different decisions and the expected value means that we have uncertain but we understand uh, the probabilistic we, we understand the probability of dis different outcomes and what those outcomes look like, and then we can have a probability weighted expected value that helps facilitate that decision. So that's essentially what we're doing in, in the context of decision trees. So what we have to do to, to build that foundation is first we, de we determine the states of nature. What happens in market good, bad, uh, uh, technology works or it doesn't work. Uh, and, and so we understand what the what the probability of those uh, different states of nature are is, and what the outcome related with that uh, state of nature is. And we, we then analyze it using a, dis, uh, a decision tree. So here we have a, a, a simple example of a decision tree. Uh, and, and I'll reiterate this again later. If we have a square in a decision tree, we have a decision. So in this case, we're deciding between a large plant a medium plant and a small plant or doing nothing. And if we do nothing, the return is zero. We have no costs and we have no, uh, we have no revenues. If we choose to build a large plant, then we have a circle here and a circle is an uncertain outcome. So in, the, in, in this case, this means we have a probabilistic outcome and we can't make a choice. I would argue that the biggest mistake that students make is they treat these things as choices. So they say, well, I look here, I'm going to make a cho choice for a large plant, and then I'm going to choose a favorable market and I will make $100,000. Well, you can't choose something that is uncertain. Where And so we have here a probability. The market is favorable with a probability of 0.4 and unfavorable with a probability of 0.6. And then we would come up with an expected monetary value uh, 0 0.4 times 100,000 plus 0 0.6 times negative 90,000, and then get that expected value here. And in most cases, when our criterion is maximize expected monetary value, we would choose the one of those with the highest return. So uh, here we have, as I said, the expected monetary value is 0.4 which is the probability of a favorable market times 100,000, which is the return with a favorable market, plus 0.6, which is the probability of an unfavorable market, times negative 90,000, which is the outcome. So the expected monetary value, if we build a, a large plant, our expected monetary value is negative 14,000. Now, under no circumstances will we actually lose 90, uh, 14,000. We will either lose 90,000 or we will make 100,000, but the expected value based on the probability weighting is negative 14,000, and it gives us then insight into that decision-making process. Um, Uh, and so if we would do the same thing. I'll go through another example here shortly. So we have, as I said before, notation in decision trees. If we have a square, if we have a decision. So in that circumstance, we can make a choice uh, and, and we choose one branch or another. If we have a circle, we have a state of nature or an uncertain outcome. And in that circumstance, we can't make a choice. 
We can't choose a favorable market. We can't choose an unfavorable market. We have different probabilities associated with those. And in those cases, we pick, uh, 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 we, we develop an expected value and then we can go back to the decision. Now, we can also have decisions after uncertain outcomes and I'll show you examples of that uh, later. So here we have a decision node, large plant, small plant, nothing, and a state of nature node. So again, just reiterating it, I, I, I hate to sort of continue to dwell on this unnecessarily maybe, but I think it is necessary because this is the place where students go wrong the easiest. They, they, they uh, uh, we're gonna choose a large plant and then choose a favorable market it has the best return. And, and we can't do that. We come up with an expected value. So in this case, we have uh, construct a large plant, return is 200,000. If the market is favorable, it's negative 180,000. If it's unfavorable, if we construct a small plant, it's 100,000 if it's a favorable market and negative 20,000 if it's an unfavorable market and doing nothing in either case results in returns of zero. Uh, and so uh, we can also, uh, and, and we would come up with the expected values based on the probabilities of favorable versus unfavorable market and then make the choice with the highest, uh, highest expected monetary value. We can also use a different set of criteria uh, we can evaluate a decision tree using the maxi-max uh, uh, criterion, which is the alternative that maximizes the maximum outcome for every alternative. So we say in this circumstance, uh, it, we would build a large plant because its return is 200,000 if we have a favorable market, whereas if we build a small plant, the best we can do is 100,000. That ignores the negative outcomes, but it just says, if we want the absolute, if we want to make a choice that maximizes our opportunity for return, that would be maxi-max. It's the highest possible gain. We can also do maxi-min or mini-max, which is find the alternative that maximizes the minimum outcome for every alternative. So this means we want to, we want to choose the outcome that has the least bad outcome, uh, and in that case, we would pick the, uh, the do-nothing approach because both the large plant and the small plant, if the market was unfavorable, had losses. So do-nothing, the maximum minimum would be zero, uh, and uh, in, uh, in the other cases, it would be, uh, there'd be negative numbers. So if we want to avoid the worst case scenario, the pessimistic approach, we would use the maximin. Generally though, we use uh, the uh, expected monetary value. Uh, we can also, if we, if we don't do probabilistic weighting, we can also do equally likely, find the alternative with the highest average outcome. This uh, assumes that every state of nature is equally likely to occur, and, and, and you might use that if you don't have a sense of the probability. But in general, we, we assign probabilities and then weight the expected value by those probabilities. So let's go back to, to this one. Uh, in this case, the maxi-max choice is to construct a large plant because the maximum is 200,000, versus 100,000 versus zero in those rows. And as I said, the maximin is negative 180,000, negative 20,000 and zero. If we weight them as equally likely, favorable or unfavorable, we then come up with a, an expected value, which is just the average in this case, but is the same as saying 0 0.5 times 100,000 times 0 0.5 times 180,000, which gives us a value of 10. Uh, we do the same here, we get a value of 40,000, and we do the same here, we get zero. So in this case, the highest expected value, monetary value, is to construct a small plant. Now again, we won't make 40,000, we will either make uh, 100,000, or we'll lose uh, 200,000, and so uh, that, uh, that, uh, is why, uh, or sorry, you lose, that should be 20,000. Uh, or, uh, and 
So we still have uncertain outcomes, but based on the probability weighting, we make the choice of constructing a small plant. So in this circumstance, it helps us deal with risk or deal with uncertainty. So each possible state of nature has an assumed probability. States of nature are mutually exclusive. That means they are discrete states of nature. You can't have, uh, you have to have things that are not overlapping. They are mutually exclusive. The probabilities must sum to one, that's basic probability theory. Uh, and then you determine the expected monetary value for each alternative. So this is very much like the average, but in the average, they assume they're equally likely. In this case, we assign a probability to each outcome and it doesn't need to be just two, it can be multiple. Uh, and then come up with an expected value. So the expected monetary value is uh, the probability of the first stage of nature times the payoff, plus the probability of the second state of nature times the payoff, plus however many states of nature and probabilities that sum to one, and you get essentially a weighted average uh, expected monetary value for that uncertain outcome, that round one, that allows you then to go back and make a, make a choice. Um, so uh, here we had equally probable, we had 10,000, we had uh, 40,000, and we had zero. And so in that circumstance, we would cut these two branches and make a choice for constructing a small plant. It's the best option. So that is the basics. I'd encourage you to watch the more detailed building a, building a decision tree uh, video that I have posted that goes through that development and the calculations uh, in a much more uh, systematic way. So the last uh, point I want to make here is what if we could do some research or do some market research and have a sense of what the outcome is going to be? What if we could remove the uncertainty and essentially uh, give us certainty? And, and so then if there was a cost associated with that, is the cost of perfect information worth it? So in order to do that, we need to determine the expected value of perfect information. So Previously, we've incorporated uncertainty by weighting these things by, uh, by uh, probabilities and coming up with the expected value. And now we can determine the expected value of perfect information and we can look at the difference between the two to give us a sense of what we could afford to invest to give us certainty in the circumstances. So the expected value of perfect information is the difference between the expected value with perfect information and the expected monetary value that we did before. So the expected value with perfect information, and again, this is sometimes easier to understand with an example. So when you finish this video, I would encourage you to go directly to the other one on decision trees where I work through a specific example and it includes expected value with perfect information. So what you have then uh, is rather than coming up with a, uh, uh, ra sorry, rather than coming up with a uh, weighted probability for each outcome, what you do is you take the best outcome or consequence for the first state of nature, so in, in our previous example, that was a favorable market outcome. So in that case, it was build a large plant. Our return would be $200,000 and our probability would be times 0.5 plus the best outcome for the second state of nature, which is if we had an unfavorable market, it would be to do nothing. And that was zero. And that would say, if we knew for sure we would have a favorable market, we would choose the large plant. If we knew for sure we would have an unfavorable market, we would do nothing. And so we come up with the probability of those two things happening and an expected value that we know which one is going to happen and then which choice we would make. That gives us the expected value with perfect 
information. So, as I said, the best outcome for the state of nature favorable market is to build a large facility with a payoff of 200,000. The best outcome for unfavorable is do nothing with a payoff of zero. So the expected value with perfect information is 200,000 times 0 0.5 plus zero times 0 0.5 is equal to $100,000. So if we knew for certain when we were making the, de the decision, whether we we're going to have a favorable market or an unfavorable market, that would make the decision be pretty easy. If we had the favorable market, we would build a large plant. If we had unfavorable, we would do nothing uh, and make nothing. Uh, and the expected value of that, the expected value of knowing exactly what's going to happen is $100,000. So then we take uh, uh, the expected value with perfect information, which is $100,000 and subtract the maximum expected monetary value, which we calculated as $40,000. And so the expected value of perfect information is $60,000. So our expected value would go from 40,000 to 100,000 uh, if we knew for sure, certain what our outcome was. So we would be willing to pay up to $60,000 to remove any uncertainty from the decision-making process. So decision trees, uh, uh, information in decision tables can be displayed as decision trees, which just gives you a nice visual way of tracking the decision. It's a graphic display, a visual display of the decision pro processes and, and highlights the difference between decisions and states of nature or, or uncertain outcomes and lets you calculate what your expected value is. And it's appropriate for showing sequential decisions. So you could say, if we made this decision and we had these outcomes, what decision would we make in the, in the future? And I again, highlight the, pre, the, the example. So here is one, uh, you can, I uh, usually in examples with introductory operations management, we usually do them by hand. Uh, as these decisions get bigger and bigger and bigger, they're often automated. Uh, and here you can see an example in, in, uh, uh, in Excel. So you've got a decision here to test. Uh, and you have a decision. Uh, uh, if you do no decisions, then you have another decision, yes or no. And then you have uncertain, low, medium, high uh, costs and low and, and also different outcomes, dry, wet, soaking in terms of, of the amount of oil. So you can have sequential uh, uncertain events and then sequential decisions and various combinations. And it just depends fundamentally on what you're trying to do. So four decision trees, define the problem, structure or draw the decision tree. And we usually do that from left to right. And I'll highlight again to go look at the example. We start at the first decision and any subsequent uncertainty or decisions get built from left to right. And then we, un we assign probabilities, estimate payoffs, and then we work backwards in the decision tree to, to determine the expected monetary value for each state of nature node. So then we can make uh, the decision based on an understanding of that uncertainty. So define the problem, draw the decision tree from left to right, understand the probabilities that you have, understand the estimates you have for various choices and various states of nature, and then you solve the problem from right to left uh, in order to uh, understand what your expected monetary value is. This is a very quick uh, introduction to decision trees. And again, I will link you to the the example that I worked through that should make it clearer uh, as, as to the process we go through. Have a great day.